us. But Israel, Israel is an empty vine. He bringeth forth fruit unto himself according to the multitude of his fruit. He has increased the altars according to the goodness of his land. They have made goodly images. Look at verse 2. In verse 2, it says, Now their heart is divided. Their heart is divided. They are not staying on God. They are not focusing on God. They are not relying on God. They are not walking. They are not living for the glory of God alone. They are looking for another thing. It says their heart is divided. Now shall they be found faulty. When your heart is divided, when you are not totally leaning on the Lord, when you are not totally serving the Lord, but you have another thing in focus, it says you will be found faulty. It shall break down their altars. He shall spoil their images. Look at verse 12. In verse 12, now it says, So to yourselves in righteousness. If you're going to serve the Lord, if you're going to be steadfast with the Lord, if you're not going to remain superficial, so to yourselves in righteousness. Reap in mercy. Break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness upon you. Hey, look at Matthew chapter 23. The people that have superficial fruit without faith in the Savior. It's not faith in the Savior producing what they're doing is self-effort. It's commitment to religion. His commitment to the things that they think people will appreciate. And he'll go any length to have the praise of men. Superficial fruit without faith in the Savior. Matthew chapter 23, verse 23. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye pay the tithe of mint and anise, and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law. The weightier matters of the law, that one, they omitted justice or judgment, mercy, faith. These ought ye to have done. That he is giving of tithes, ye yes, should have done that. That's all right. But you shouldn't have left the other undone. Everything you do in action, in life, in expression of what you believe must be coming from the heart of faith. Look at verse 25. In verse 25, it says, Woe unto you, scribes, and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye make clean the outside of the cup, meticulous, the outside of the club of the cup. What people will see, what people will know, they're meticulous in keeping that right, in keeping that clean. And it says you do that for the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess okay they know people will not see this their hearts have not been cleansed their hearts have not been emptied of evil things of defilement look at verse 28 in verse 28 it says even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men righteous unto men that is unto men who are not living with them the people who are living with them they can tell they can tell of the temper they can tell of the anger they can tell of evil action those who are living with them but those who don't know them 
they appear righteous unto men uh, the people who look at only the outward expression thank you sir if that's only what you're looking at thank you madam and then you bend if that's all you're looking for and you don't know the heart they appear righteous outwardly unto men but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity of hypocrisy and iniquity why don't you check up your heart check up on your life we have heard enough we know about salvation and we know if any man be in Christ is a new creature how new are you the new creature in the new covenant we know that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees ye shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of God do you ever think of entering the kingdom of God or do you just act like a Pharisee or do you just live like a Pharisee when last did you ask for grace to do what you need to do beyond your human strength? When last did you pray that God will give you the power to subdue the flesh and subdue the depravity that is trying to raise his ugly head from your life? Are you not just satisfied with the outward dressing up? outward appearance outward uh, similarity to the saints of god is that enough that superficial fruit without faith in the savior and we're looking at isaiah chapter 58 and we're reading from verse 1 isaiah chapter 58 verse 1 Cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression, and the house of Jacob their sin. Look at verse 2. In verse 2, yet they seek me daily. Do you know the people that go to church daily? There are. Do you know the people that go to prayer meeting daily in their church? There are. Do you know the people that study the Bible every day? I mean, in the church congregation, there are. And yet it says, they seek me daily and delight to know my ways. They like to have the word preach unto them. They delight to know my ways. And it says, as a nation that did righteousness, as if they did righteousness, and forsook not the ordinance of their God, they ask of me the ordinance of justice. They take delights in approaching to God. Are they righteous because of that? No. If you read the following verses, it shows that they did not really know God. They didn't delight in the word that will make them turn, make them repent, make them seek the Lord. They were superficial worshippers. They didn't have faith, real faith in God. In Revelation chapter 2, we're reading from verse 4. It says, nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee. You know, these are people, the angel to the church in Ephesus, the members of the church, the minister of the church in Ephesus. They loved doctrine and they are very vigilant on doctrine. If anybody comes and does not bring that doctrine, they can spot it out immediately and they can say that's false doctrine, that's wrong doctrine, that's not scriptural doctrine. We're honestly contending for the faith once delivered unto the saints. That's good, but nevertheless, I have somewhat against them. 
because thou hast led thy first love. Look at verse 5. In verse 5, it says, Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, the one that has dropped the first love is fallen. The one that has dropped the original consecration is fallen. The one that is not looking at circumstances before they can manifest their love to Christ is falling. The one that is, you know, when he's not happy, is not holy. Their happiness must come first. If there's no happiness, there's no holiness. They are not holy unto the Lord because after all, I'm not happy. Why should I be holy? Those people, they bled their first consecration and their first commitment. And it says, remember where thou hast fallen. And then it says, repent and do the first works or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of its place except thou repent. You know, we've heard of that repentance a lot, yet we'll put the repentance in a pigeonhole. Those who are adulterers, they must repent. Those who tell lies, they must repent. And those who are not in our church, they're coming for the first time. And they don't dress like we recommend, they must repent. About the people that lost their first love. The false sensitivity to the voice of the Spirit. How about them? Are they not going to repent? How about the people that are just offering superficial sacrifice and they do not have deep, deepening faith in Christ? Are they not to repent? Yes, they have to repent. Otherwise, they will come and take the candlestick. I will look at number two here. Number two, we're looking at the spectacular fruits without the fruit of the Spirit. Would you know the people that have spectacular fruits and, and they know and they, they rejoice in that. They think that is the end of the road. They have spectacular, spectacular fruit. Look at Matthew chapter 7. Reading from verse 21, Matthew 7, verse 21, Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. The people that feel calling Christ, Lord, Lord, that's sufficient. They never even make an effort to do the will of the Father who is in heaven. What the will of the Father? Our salvation, our redemption, our righteousness, our sanctification, our purity of heart, our life without reproach, our life free of offense toward God and toward man. That's the will of God. The people that never think about the will of God, all they think about is miracle, healing, deliverance. Look at verse 22. In verse 22, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name have done many wonderful works. They're running after signs and wonders. And even when the opportunity is there to be saved, to examine our lives, whether we be in the face or not, that one, there's no concern for that. The concern they have is for prophecy, is for mighty works, it's for casting out devils. Verse 23. In verse 23, then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. 
doing mighty works, I never knew you. They did not have the fruit that showed that the Holy Spirit is present in their lives. Then when I profess unto them, I never knew you, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Where should your priority be? Your priority should be on having the fruit of the Spirit. Christ is coming, and he may come soon, any time from now. And if all you have is that I got a miracle, not only that, I give miracles to other people. I fast, I pray. I have the gifts of the Spirit. I have the word of knowledge. I have the word of wisdom. And I have faith to move mountains. But your heart does not have that holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. At the end, you'll be of all men the most miserable. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, reading from verse 1. Though I speak of the tongues of men and of angels, and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. Verse 2. In verse 2 it says, And though I have the gift of prophecy, and understand all mysteries and all knowledge and though i have all faith so that i could remove mountains and have not charity the love that works by faith i am nothing look at verse 3 it says in verse 3 and though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned. You know, there are people that are fanatical. And if there is any argument about your church and our church, they can fight. They can say, Our pastor is the best in the land. No, we have a pastor you have not heard. A pastor is greater, better, and deeper than your deeper pastor. Then they remove their coat and are ready to fight. What are they fighting about? They're fighting about opinions. They're fighting about what he says against our people and what he's saying about his people. If you give your body to be burnt, and you are ready to defend your ideology. You are ready to defend your religion. You are ready to defend anything that you appreciate, that other people don't appreciate. If you die in that anger, in that annoyance, you die in that hot, furious temper, there's no heaven there. You see, what's important is the fruit of the Spirit will to have. The love and the joy and the peace and the gentleness and the meekness and the long suffering and the fidelity, the faith and the steadfast and the temperance, the self control. That's, that's what we need, and that is what shows that we belong to the Lord. But fighting about this and fighting about that and about this other thing, it says will miss the kingdom of God. We're looking at Matthew chapter 24, and I'm reading from verse 24. Matthew chapter 24, verse 24, and it says, For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders. Don't be deceived. In these last days, there will arise prophets, false prophets, and false Christ that will show great signs and wonders in so much that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. In verse 25, it says, Behold, I have told you before. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Reading from verse 9, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9. Even him 
whose coming is after the walking of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. The signs that deceive, the wonders that deceive, the miracles that deceive, lying wonders. In verse 10, in verse 10 it says, And with all deceivableness of a righteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth. They received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. All they're looking for is the sensational that will make them feel excited. Look at that miracle. Look at that miracle. But they do not have the love for the truth that they might be saved. Look at yourself. Have you shifted your ground? Have you shifted from having salvation to having just signs and wonders and miracles? Look at verse 11. In verse 11, it says, And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. There are people, millions of them, in the world once they see miracle they don't examine the doctrine the people preach once they see healing deliverance and once they see some sensational things that man can pray and once he prays look at what happens they do not look at the false doctrine beneath that miracle and it says because of that God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. In verse 12, verse 12 says that they all might be damned who believed not the truth but had pleasure in righteousness. We're looking at number three here. Number three, the simulated fruit without the foundation of surrender. If we're going to be acceptable to the Lord, there must be absolute surrender unto Him. It will have all or nothing. If you're bargaining, God, I give part of my heart and part of my love and part of my devotion unto you, I have another entity. I have another deity that I want to give the other part of my love, the other part of my consecration, the other part of my devotion. It says he will not share his glory with any other deity, with any other man. He will not share the submission you have with any other. He will not even share it with you. If you want to keep part of the surrender, part of the submission, part of the consecration, part of your love for yourself, it's not going to accept your self-love but the love of God. Simulated fruit without the foundation of surrender. And we're looking at Luke chapter 16. And I'm reading from verse 13. Luke chapter 16 verse 13 it says no servant can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or else he will hold to the one and he will despise the other ye cannot serve God and mammon we must make a choice if we're going to love God, love Him with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. He wants total, absolute surrender. And He wants that before any other thing you offer unto Him. What if a wife in the home will say, My husband, this is just who I am. I cook your food. 
I'll take care of the house. I'll be a great, a good homemaker. Only one thing I cannot give you. I cannot submit or surrender on that one I hold. And nothing can take that away from me. Yes, I know I'm married, but surrender, submission, never. But I cook your food, I wash your clothes, I do everything, only that. What kind of marriage will that be? That kind of wife will make you a puppet that she can trample upon you and go anywhere because there's no surrender. The same thing, that's the way people are treating God. They say, God, I read your book. I read the Bible, I'll serve you, I'll worship, I'll do everything, but my worship will be devoid of surrender and submission. What do you think God thinks about that? He doesn't want those simulated fruits without absolute surrender unto Him. That's why He says, No man can serve God. And mammon, look at verse 14. In verse 14, and the Pharisees also, who are covetous, heard all these things, and they derided him. He preached well, they derided him. He preached the truth, they derided him. He spoke words of life eternal they derided him they looked down on him they disrespected him why he was telling the truth but the truth came too near their door and because the truth came so much near them that's why they derided them and in verse 15 verse 15 says and he said unto them you know, it's good to have Christ as a model, as an example, as a perfect pattern that he will not shrink back because they derided him. His mouth will not be muscled because they derided him. He will not stop telling the truth, the burning truth in the hearts of men because they derided him and so he said unto them ye are they we justify yourselves before men but God knoweth your hearts for that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. And that's what we need to understand, that uh, if we're serving the Lord, there's no pretense, there's no cover up, there's no superficiality. And we're looking at uh, Romans chapter 10, reading from verse 3. Romans chapter 10, we're reading from verse 3. It says, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not have not have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God simulated fruit without the foundation of surrender we're coming to point number three point number three we're looking at the demand for explicit very clear or shaded unclouded faith with expected fruit the demand of god the expectation of god the thing that God is looking for in every heart, every heart that comes to him, that's the demand of explicit faith. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to leave the awe of the Chaldeans, he led going after what God had said, not knowing whither he went. Faith 
in action. By faith, Noah, when he was told to build an ark, he moved with fear and faith so that he built the ark for the safety of his family and the people that were here. By faith, Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he walked with God. These were people that had explicit faith, clear faith that you could see and you can tell here in the faith of the true believer. And that's what God demands. He doesn't want a kind of doubtful faith. <laughs> Is that faith or something similar to faith? He doesn't want a kind of a superficial faith that has no action, that has no demonstration that this is total, complete, absolute faith unto God. The demand for explicit faith with the expected fruit. In James chapter 2, we're reading from verse 18. James chapter 2, reading from verse 18. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. In verse 19, verse 19, thou believest that there is one God that doest well, the devils also believe and tremble. What's the apostle uh, James telling us here? He said, when you see the judgment of God, when you hear of the judgment of God, when you hear that God is a consuming fire, do you tremble? Do you stop what you're doing? Do you turn around? Do you repent? Do you go to God with a sober heart? He said, if you don't, well, the devils tremble when they hear of the coming judgment and when Christ comes and he wants to drive out the legion. They're so afraid, they tremble. They say, don't cast us into the abyss. And then, they said there are swine there, cast us there, and they said go. You see, they tremble because they know the judgment to come. Do you tremble when you hear of the judgment to come? The axe is laid on the root of the tree. And everyone that comes to God and believes in God must repent and turn away from evil. Uh, we're looking at three things here. Number one, examine your faith in the light of the New Testament. Examine your faith in the light of, look at Abraham. Hebrews chapter 11. Look at Abel. Look at Enoch. Look at Noah. Look at Moses. Look at the Jericho walls, how they fell. Look at the expression of faith and examine your faith in the light of the New Testament. Number two, evaluate your faith. Are you weighed and found wanting? Is your faith going to make you ready for the coming of the Lord? Why are you coming to study the word of God and never evaluate what you have? Whether what you have is enough to enter into the kingdom or not. Evaluate your faith in line with noticeable trembling. Number three, express your faith with a life of noble truthfulness. Look at number one. Number one, Examine your faith in the light of the New Testament. We're told in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. 
examine yourselves whether ye be in the faith examine yourselves well you just hear the word of god right so let us pray you stand there and you are waiting for in the in jesus name we pray have you prayed have you examined yourself have you thought of everything you have heard and compared with what you possess what you have are you just there you hear sound but did you understand the meaning of the sound as it reflects on your life examine yourselves whether you be in the faith prove your own selves know ye not your own selves how that jesus christ is in you except ye be reprobates he wants us to examine our lives he wants us to examine if christ shall come today am i ready for the calling of the saints of above we're well, looking at number two here number two evaluate your face in line with noticeable trembling evaluate that faith evaluate that faith and we're coming to some two and we're reading from verse 11 in some two verse 11 serve the lord of fear and rejoice with trembling and rejoice with trembling this is the inspired word of god do you ever tremble anything will reach do you pass it on to others that's talking about the pharisees that's talking about the sadducees that's talking about the disciples before the cross that's talking about leaders and preachers and you put everything in different pigeon holes and you never put anything in your pigeon hole where will you spend eternity serve the lord or fear what kind of fear should i all do all this running up running down sweating climbing descending and yet what if i'm not acceptable to god in the final day what if my secret deeds are so serious and blamable in the sight of god and all these outward activities are not going to recommend me to god that's what it's saying Rejoice with trembling. Verse 12. In verse 12, it says, Kiss the son, lest he be angry and ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. But blessed are all they that put their trust in him. They trust him for salvation and they have real, genuine salvation. They trust God for sanctification and they have real purging, purifying of their heart and life. They trust God for steady faith, steadfast faith, and the Lord keeps them up, kept by the power of the Lord unto that final salvation that shall be revealed. They trust God that the grace of God will be sufficient for them in trial, in tribulation, in persecution, in misunderstanding, in suffering. They trust God that nothing will stop them on this or what journey to heaven. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. We're looking at Philippians chapter 2. In Philippians chapter 2, we're looking at verse 12. It says, Wherefore, my beloved, my brethren, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, walk out 
your own salvation this paul the apostle by the spirit of god it's not even james now because they tell us that you know paul understood faith faith without works i told you already is the faith to enter but now that you are in the way in the narrow way that leads to heaven walk out your own salvation will fear and trembling then in verse 13 in verse 13 for it is god which walketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure verse 14 do all things without murmurings those are the people that have faith they know that what they are called to do is by god they know that the work they're doing that the work of god and they know is not man and whatever man feels about what they do or doesn't feel about what they do that's not a concern to them they know because i am called of god and because god is watching over everything i do i must do all things without murmurings and disputing can i tell you something whatever you cannot do without murmuring don't do it people might search for you and look for you where are you where are you we'll be waiting for you if you cannot do it without murmuring don't do it it brings condemnation it brings judgment it brings the heavy vengeance of god when you're doing it and doing it, but you're murmuring and complaining and disputing whatever you cannot do without you know fighting with somebody without knocking somebody without murmuring disputing just don't do it, just give it up because if we're going to be appreciated by god recognized by god must do all things without murmurings and disputings look at verse 15 in verse 15 it says that ye may be blameless and harmless the sons of god without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom ye shine as light in the world look at verse 16 in verse 16 holding forth the word of life don't murmur don't grumble you're a preacher this is happening that is happening don't preach then you have to murmur because you're wasting your time if you have to complain if you have to grumble if you have to dispute if you have to fight in preaching don't preach don't allow any murmuring any complaining and any disputing and any debate and any grumbling holding forth the word of life that i may rejoice in the day of christ that i have not run in vain if you murmur you run in vain if you dispute and debate you are running in vain if you are grumbling i'm doing it i'm grumbling i'm doing it i'm fighting that person i'm doing it i'm you know turning things upside down you run in vain neither labored in vain i pray you will not labor in vain i said you in particular you will not labor in vain to serve the Lord with joy, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And whatever comes after that, you keep on rejoicing. I say unto you, rejoice. We're looking at number three here. Number three, we're looking at express your faith. Anywhere you are, express your faith. What do you believe? How do you believe? everything you believe express your faith with the enemies around express your faith with people on the opposite side they don't believe what you believe all the same in an excited manner explicit manner express your faith your faith with a life of noble 
truthfulness. A life of noble truthfulness. We're looking at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25. This is how you express your faith anywhere you are. There's no deception, there's no lie. What you believe is what you believe. And you express that. You express that with word. You express that with your action. You express that with the way you live so that we know you have an explicit and expressive faith. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25, wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. If I tell a lie, what am I telling a lie? I fear the person I'm talking to. And if he hears the real truth from me, he might be angry at me. But if I tell a lie, God will be angry at me. But because I lift up the man, the woman, above God, I forget the anger of God, and I'm running away from the anger of a man, of a woman. That's why we tell lies. It may be a lie to cover up something I've done. Why do I have to cover up? But they will see, come not as righteous as they thought. If I tell them the truth, and so what? Am I going to deceive myself or deceive them, become hypocritical? And so I have to tell a lie to cover up who I am really. Ah, then I'm a hypocrite. But you've done something wrong. Even without their asking, you can tell them this is what I did wrong, but I've gone to pray and the Lord has forgiven me. It's left to them to believe or not to believe. But for you to go out and make it a lifestyle, a habit, because you are always afraid what they will think of me, what they will say of me. And because of that, you live a lie all your life. It says, wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor. For we are members one of another. I tell him the truth. He says, what? You are like that? You did that? I'm sorry. And then he rains some acidic words on me. That's my fault. I did that. So I accept those acidic words. But you know what? He will forget. I will forget in five years' time, ten years' time. But... I'm living in a lie and God records that in heaven until I have the courage to go back and tell him and tell her you know what I've been a big zero a big hypocrite I told you that lie to cover up now please forgive me then my record here is clean and my record over there is clean and forever I live in freedom. You are living in a lie. You are living in bondage. And you don't know the next thing you will say that will contradict what you said before because you need another lie, a bigger lie to cover up a small lie. Express your faith. Express your truthfulness. And live the way a child of God ought to live. Not minding what they think of you. It says, wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor. For we are members one of another. In Ephesians chapter 6, reading from verse 14. Ephesians 6, verse 14. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about of truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. Verse 15, in verse 15, and your feet showed what the preparation of the gospel of peace. In verse 16, it says, above all, 
taking the shield of faith wherewith we shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. You can. I can. I can. I can. How many years have you been a Christian, a believer? How many years have you been coming to the Bible study every Monday here? And yet we find people coming, coming, coming. The fear, the attacks of the devil, the arrows of the devil. And they run from deeper to shallow, looking for deliverance. I bought everything you've been hearing all these years. Think about it. Who do I run to? If there's any attack, there's no attack. But if there were attack, affliction, who do I run to? Do I run from deep and light to shallow light to shallow assembly? Please pray for me. Pray for me. Uh -uh. Look at this. Above all. Take it yourself. Take the shield of faith wherewith ye shall be able. You'll be able. From today, you are able in Jesus' name. And it says that you will be able, able to quench all. How many? How many? All the furry darts of the wicked. Look at verse 17 and take the shield, the element of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The Word of God. Take it. Do you have your Bible there? Where is it? Where? All the promises there are for you. All the provision there for you. Yeah. This Bible will not run away from any devil, any demon, any power of darkness. Yeah. Put it in your heart and let it come out of your mouth. Every demon will run away from you. Yeah. All the powers of darkness will be broken and destroyed in Jesus' name. We've been looking here and there. We've been looking there, in that place and that place. Stop looking around. Look into the world. Your victory will be permanent in Jesus' name. Rise up now. Rise up and let us talk to the Lord in prayer. He wants us to have faith. The faith that over. The faith that conquers every time. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer. Evidential proof of saving faith in Christ. Let it be evident, known, observable that you have faith. And let's see the proof of that faith there's no saving faith without appropriate fruit spiritual fruit if the fruit is not there you don't have saving faith the fruit of the spirit the love the joy the peace the long suffering as a fruit. If you are saved, if you have believed on the Lord unto salvation, the fruit will be there. Gentleness will be there. It's aggressive spirit, living like a lion, wanting to pounce on other people. That's not gentleness. That doesn't show that you've met Christ and you've got saving faith. 
meekness. The pride that wants to lord each over all other people. Anybody can have pride. You don't have to have salvation to have pride. Grace to have pride. You don't have to have faith to have pride. That's the fruit of the Adamic nature. But when you come to Christ, and you believe truly in Christ, and that faith in Christ has turned your life around, there will be the fruit of meekness and gentleness, fidelity, integrity. You'll be trustworthy, trustable, when you have that saving faith. Believing of the Lord Jesus Christ brings righteousness, integrity, good life, righteous life. There's no sanctifying faith without scriptural fruit. When you're sanctified, your heart is pure. Your life is pure. Your secret, privacy, pure. When you're sanctified, no evil imagination, no appearance of evil, no covering up, the depravity of the Adamic nature, supported, destroyed. And you love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. You have steadfast faith. Whatever they do, whatever they say against you, your faith is steadfast in the Lord. Do not deceive yourself. Be plain, truthful to yourself. And whatever you know you are missing, go back to Calvary. Reaffirm your faith in the Lord. Father, we well, thank you today for the word you have spoken to us. I pray, Lord, the grace to receive everything. Grant to everyone in Jesus' name. And whatever counterfeit faith, fake and fatal, that we possess, take it out of our lives in Jesus' name. The faith saving faith, the faith sanctifying faith, the faith steadfast faith that bears appropriate fruit given to everyone in Jesus' name. Help us to keep on looking unto Jesus and help us, Lord, that we forget what people say, what people think, what people feel of us, but to center our focus, our faith, our leaning, our confidence, and trust in you and you alone. Give us that light that is lived in Christ, lived by Christ in us, lived for Christ and for his glory. Help us, Lord, that from now on, our eyes will be on the Lord alone. And all the fear of man, all the focus on man, all trembling before man, cancel from every life. Make us live 
the victorious land. And every arrow, every dart, fiery dart of the devil will quench everything in Jesus' name. Everything you conquered at Calvary will be under our feet. Everything you provided at Calvary will reflect in our lives. That a life will not be lived on the shadow of a man, but in the splendor of a mediator. Confirm in every life. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Yeah.